<clears throat> okay, so today we're going to talk about Josekis. The Joseki lecture I had in mind is simple ways to learn Josekis uh, and what Josekis I recommend for, like, starting out. Okay, so this is more double-digit Q, but single-digit Qs can benefit and double-check their Joseki basics use from this lecture. Uh, but technically, this is more double-digit Q than single-digit Q, but hopefully everyone will find it beneficial. So, first off, with uh, when choosing a Joseki, okay, when choosing a Joseki, the important thing to remember is it's more about direction of play than it is about a specific variation. So, the direction of play is you have to say which side is the open side, A or B. So, let's say my opponent approaches. Excuse me. Um, if I want to say which side is the open side, I actually just back up one move in my head and say, was A side or B side the big side? Usually, um, actually, I'm not going to say that. Uh, I'm not going to say usually it's one or the other. So just whichever side is the open side. So if my opponent approaches, I'll back up one and say, was it A or B? If it's A, I'm going to choose a Joseki that goes in that direction. And if it's B, I'll choose a Joseki that goes in that direction. So that means when I learn Josekis, when I look them up and I want to learn some basic Josekis, I'm going to start with A and B. Okay? I'm going to start with one on that side, one on this side. Okay? One on one side, one on the other side. I'm going to give myself at least an option to play on both direction of plays. Okay? Now I'm going to take it one step further. Sometimes I want to be on the third line, and sometimes I want to, want to be on the fourth line. So I get C uh, and D. The reason is I want to have a Joseki for the right direction of play, and I want to have a Joseki for the right line that I'm supposed to be on. So if I'm supposed to be developing, I want to be on the fourth line. If I'm supposed to be staying uh, solid and safe, I want to be on the third line. So this is how I would start learning Josekis. Two options per side, one low, one high. Okay? That is the Josekis I would start with. That is the Josekis I would learn first. And I would add on Josekis as needed. So as you play out these variations and people do different things in your games, then every time someone plays something that's not the Josekis that you know, then you go look it up. You learn a new variation, and then you come back and you play it right the next time. Okay? So that's how you learn one Joseki at a time, and you learn what is relevant to your level. So I have proper direction of play, and then I also have relevance to something I can use at my level, which is my opponent playing um, something. I will know how to respond, because if it comes up at my level, that means it's my level. Okay? So now I'm going to talk about some simple Josekis for you. The first one, obviously, is going to be this knight's move. This is the like one of the first ones you should learn. Probably the second one now because everyone learns a 3-3 first because it's so freaking common. But let's talk about this one first. This one is very simple. Slide. And why is the slide? Well, well, let's just show the Joseki first. I block my base. He makes a base. Okay. So let's talk about why. So first off, I extend along the side. So you could go here because one stone jumps two. But this just leads to simpler variations, so just kind of trust us on this one. Uh, one stone, fourth line likes to come down to the third line, one space away for an enclosure. Okay, so imagine like a, you have a shamari. Fourth line likes to come down to the third line, one space away to enclose. Okay, so that's a common shape that we learn. So the next thing we should do is weak groups first. Let's make a base, right? That should be our next move. But before we do that we can slide. Second line is very small in the opening, but in this case, it's one of the exceptions. And the exception for when uh, we can play on the second line of the opening is when we're dealing with faces. So what does this move do? This move is trying to take Black's base. Okay? So we do that because we can, do, we can threaten Black's base and then come back and still make our base so our eye space is actually bigger. So we got to expand our eye space and make it a little bit bigger for free. It's a free exchange. Okay. Uh, we cannot block directly as black because if we do this, our opponent Hanes, 
And you can see that we lose our base because our opponent lives in the corner and we lose our base. Okay, yeah, we cut it off, but like, there's still technically, not, this is not to be played immediately, but there's technically still an easy way to handle this side on uh, this top side. So it's not uh, always good. However, for you single digit cues, this is something you should think about more often than you do. Because sometimes when you have a stone over here, letting them live in the corner is the right idea because the influence might very well be very large. So for the single digit cues watching this, try to see if this move's ever the right move. Most of the time it's not. Like probably like 90% of the time it's not. Okay, but sometimes it is. However, the basic idea is I block my base without getting cut. So I have a base and you have a base. Okay, that's like our first Joseki. Okay, um, now let's talk about the high one. High one's actually very uh, similar. It's just that. But the fourth line stone wants to come down to the third line. So you want to bring it down. And in this case, you can actually jump too. Um, because uh, this is so strong that this can't really escape. You can see that it's just too strong. Um, if you didn't follow that sequence, it's okay. You can play with this a little bit more. Uh, just know that this is the one you want to do. This one is also possible if you don't care about this move. Uh, I'm going to talk about that King's Gambit. Don't worry. Uh, at uh, at this, this one is a, a little bit more difficult to handle. It's also possible, but my recommendation is play this one. It's simpler, but also uh, effective. Like, it's still effective, and it's simpler to use. Now, the reason I like this one is because sometimes we will already have a stone over here somewhere. If we already have a third line stone, let's take, for example, we play a Shamari extension, right? Let's say we already have an extension right here. Okay. Or it, it, it can be high as well. Who cares? When we have support on both sides, when we already have support, we can go high. Be it third line or fourth line. If we have support, we can go high. And that's possible. Okay, now we're building a position. But more commonly, like let's say it's a low stone somewhere. You can go here, it can be here, or whatever. Then you can go high. That's a that's why we say we want to have a third line and fourth line option. Because if we go here, this looks really flat. It's very easy for our opponent to shoulder hit, and you can see how flat it is. It doesn't affect the center very much. We don't like flat positions. Third line wants to go up to the fourth line. Fourth line wants to go down to the third line. So if you, there's stones on both sides and there's two third lines next to each other, it's not the most ideal position. Sometimes it's okay, but it's not ideal. If you have a, a third line or you already have support, just go fourth line. Uh, now, King uh, mentioned a very good point. A lot of people like to play this attachment. I really discourage double digit cues from this attachment. Single digit cues, definitely learn it. You need to learn this. But double digit cues, I discourage it. Now, at the time of recording this video, this is kind of current. Uh, this is kind of the meta, right? This is kind of what a lot of the top players are doing. So, because top players are doing it, a lot of amateurs want to copy it because they just look at top players and they copy it without thinking. But, uh, like almost every single time this is played at a double digit cue level someone messes it up someone does it wrong okay so i don't i discourage double digit cues from playing this however if your opponent plays it there's a very easy response block this cutting point is a ladder so it's not that big of a deal just block okay you their their follow-up is usually this one because that's what the high level players play okay there's a lot of variations in here but all you need to do is just fix your cutting point because now it's not a ladder because now you're an Atari. Okay, so now just fix your cutting point. And they usually fix their cutting point some way. Whatever, right? And then you just make your base. One stone jumps two. And the reason you make your base is because technically this isn't enough space because if we draw the border right here, at best, it's a bulky five. One, two, three, four, five. 
So technically, that's not choice. So technically, we want a base though. This is a very easy response that is very uh, simple and very unlikely you'll mess it up as long as you remember, fix your cut, make your base. Simple follow-ups lead to simple results, lead to less mistakes, okay? What I don't want to see at double digit Q level is all this fancy stuff where you do that and then you just get cut off and lose your position or you do that and then you get uh, cut and you don't know what to do. Uh, I've like almost every single time, I think probably every single time someone has brought me a game to review at the double digit Q level where their opponent played this, someone messed it up. One of the two players messed it up. So at double digit Q, you, like every single time that I've seen it, I don't know if every single double digit Q messes it up, but every game that I've seen, someone messes the, this up. So the simple response is just fix your cutting point. This is not probably good for single digit Qs. At single digit Q, this one's too simple. You need to learn the other variations. So at single digit Q, you do need to research this. Um, but at double digit Q, just connect. Just connect. Fix your cutting point. Let them do whatever and just back off. Let them have all the cutting points. Let them have the problems. Okay. Uh, the other response that I sometimes see is they'll go down because they don't know the follow-up. They'll attach and not know the follow-up. If they do this, just block. Just block your base. Because they didn't take your liberty, this is still a ladder. This cutting point is still a ladder. So this cutting point is fine until you lose this liberty. And then you just nobody. And you can see it's still trapped. So just watch that cutting point. Block your base. That's all it is. That's how you deal with this. It's a simple way to deal with this attachment. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Next up, pincer. The simple joseki for the pincer is just three three. It's very simple. Okay. But before we talk about this, let's talk about the basic three three one. There's a few simple ones now for single digit cues. I recommend uh, learning AI josekis. Um, <laughs> throw that out there uh learn the uh learn the new josekis there's a lot of new 3-3 josekis to learn uh at the time of recording this video there's a lot of josekis to learn uh too much for this video like that can be an entire video in and of itself there are pros that have made youtube videos over some 3-3 variations i highly encourage watching those um if you need uh, if you're single digit queue. like learn the 3-3 variations it's very important but for double digit cues let's talk about the simple ones the very first one is this one and it's very simple all it is is black is trying to block white in the corner while making thickness black can hane right here because one cutting point is very easy to deal with one cutting point your opponent's not strong enough you just make your base make your base um, and your opponent's dead in the corner so one cutting point is easy to deal with but two cutting points maybe is a little bit difficult so that is why don't find yourself haunting later down the road because that just becomes difficult and is hard to handle. Usually it's just Nobi. Uh, and now as for white, uh, you just expand your eye space. That's all it is. You just expand your eye space because you need to live and have enough room for two eyes. You want to stop pushing on the second line as soon as possible. The as soon as possible is when black blocking you when this turn is not sente. So here, the turn is sente because of the cutting point. Okay, so we push. Here, the turn is sente because of this Aji. Okay, you don't have to know this, just know that the turn with two stones is sente. So we push one more, now the turn is gote, and you're alive. So now, even if black plays again, you're alive, okay? your life even a black place uh two moves so just respond to the second move now the joseki used to be here but this is now considered a mistake because this is also alive but this tiger's mouth is considered very strong for black so this tiger's mouth is considered a mistake to give to your opponent it's considered too strong so that is why we push one more Um, so this is the Joseki. Now, as for black, letting your opponent crawl is really good for you. Okay, if they want to keep crawling, keep crawling. 
But if you need to go somewhere else, stopping at four in a row is usually good. The reason is Hane at the head of two is bad liberties. It leads to double Hanes and double Ataris and blah, blah, blah. Uh, Hane at the head of three is the same thing because you can see there is Atari and then cut. So there's still liberty problems. So a rule of thumb is you play until you have four in a row and then you continue key if you need to. But usually just walking your opponent is pretty good. Okay, so that's the Joseki here. Okay. Now, if your opponent does play this, and if you want to learn this one, this one actually used to be much more complicated, but it's much simpler now. This is the double Hane to the 3-3. This one is actually much simpler than it used to be. It's Atari, Atari, and give up the corner. So if Black really wants the territory, that's fine. This is the way to do it. There are other sequences that are a little bit more complicated, but this is the simple one. Okay, And this is fine. White, white escapes, and Black doesn't get the thickness, but Black does get territory in the corner. And some thickness to the right. Locally, if you want to defend these four stones, the move is to go up. And this is because this Hani uh, can't be cut right off the bat. Like, it can later, but right off the bat, it leaves this move open. If you save these two stones, you can see the two liberties right here. Oops. So you have to give up the two stones. Which means we can say, hey, do you want to give up the two stones? No. Okay, now I get this Hane. And maybe I break into your Moyo, right? So that is why locally the response is to take a liberty and walk up. So if you need to run, instead of playing this knight's move, which is a tiger's mouth, instead of like escaping, take a liberty first and then escape. That way you potentially can destroy the right side influence. Not super important for you to learn all of that right now, but just know that this exists, right? And you can learn it as you go. Okay. Now, the reason we learned that is because we need to know the basics of the 3-3 to understand the one space pincer and then 3-3. So this is kind of a complementary uh, shapes. So when our opponent pincers, 3-3 is a very easy response. Now, the first one is this one, and this one is not as common, because usually if I play the pincer, it means the top side is the direction of play. However, this one is common with the San Rense, like something like the San Rense. So uh, I'll show you that one first. Uh, so block, expand, connect my stones, peep. I don't fix my cutting point here. I fix it here so I can have, you know, the monkey jump. Sorry, uh, this one. I fix this one to make it an open skirt on the top side to make the top side have no points almost. And then I, my uh, shape is actually here. This uh, knight's move knight to knight's move is a good shape to surround because it's a, it's only one cutting point on each side, so it's manageable. So this is our shape to surround. And this is very nice if the right side influence is very large. So an example of that is a San Rense. So here, the open side is the top side, so we play the pincer. Our beginner Joseki is 3-3. Three, three. We could choose this one in the San Rense because this creates a very nice framework. Okay, that's a lot of influence. It's a nice combination. But on, let's say, an empty board, um, let's say like this, m without that extension, maybe it's not the right direction to play. Maybe it's like this. May so maybe the top side's the big side. So in that case, we have a different Joseki. We have the cut. Your opponent, of course, same as a 3-3, expand your eye space. Here is the very, very, very important move. You do not play this Hane. You nobi. This Hane is a very common mistake because we just looked at our 3-3 variations and you play the Hane. However, this stone right here is a, plays a very important role for this sequence. So, the simple and old-fashioned punishment, there's an updated punishment with the AI that I encourage single-digit Q players to look up, 
But for double digit cues, it's just threaten to connect to it. Don't expand your eye space like normal, because there's a punishment. Threaten to connect to your stone. Okay? The direction of play is the top side. So if they fix their cut and surround you, like here or like here, then they're playing the wrong direction of play. Because remember, they played a pincer because the top side was interesting. So now you force them into the wrong direction of play and connected your stones. And you did it in Sente, because you have to you have you can you're alive, you can play elsewhere. So this is a little bit bad for black. However, usually your opponent doesn't know that this is a punishment, and they're like, oh, I'm still going to cut you. And then you play here. A or B will die. A or B will die. Okay? If I save A, because that's the obvious one that they're going to try to save, you play this Hane. It looks like the cut's scary, but it's not a ladder because there's an Atari. So there's actually nothing he can do. It looks scary, but it's manageable. So usually they try to run. And then you have this wedge. He cannot cut. That's a tough Atari. So he Ataris. You connect. He connects. You Atari. He connects. And you trap him against the edge. Okay. That is the punishment. Now, this is the old punishment. This is before AI came out. With the AI, there's a new modern updated punishment. I, I don't know it quite yet. I haven't learned it, and I apologize for that. Um, so, single digit cues, do look that up. But this is the old punishment, and also this is the easy one for double digit cues. Just descend. If they let you connect, it's already good for you. But usually they cut, and then you cut, A or B will die. If they save B, just trap A against the edge. And that's our third line cutting sequence. We should all know that at this level. If we're on the 19 by 19, we should know the sequence. And that's punishment. Okay, so now let's learn the actual variation. It's actually here. Then we poke this first. We say, hey, I want to do this. The reason is I want to jump. I want to jump um, as soon as I can. I don't like pushing from behind. It's bad to push from behind if you can help it. So I want to jump, or in the, uh, but that has two cutting points, right? So in this case, I would have to slide to get ahead. But now I'm on the second line. So before I do that, I Hane and threaten to save it. He blocks. I connect, and he connects. He connects the stones. And then you just one-point jump. Now, because of this stone... There's nowhere to go. This is the Joseki. And for the single digit cues, you should learn that these three stones are you can sacrifice. That is the purpose of playing A instead of B. The, pr the reason is you can squeeze um, you can squeeze the C stone if they try to kill your three stones and get massive thickness. Uh, definitely learn that if you haven't already. But for double digit cues, don't worry about it. Just know this is the sequence. Uh, so we had a question in chat. Uh, I once said years ago that you should play 10 games a week if you wanted to improve. Would I still agree with this idea? Yes, of course. Honestly, you should play a minimum of 10 games a week if you want to improve at an efficient pace. With that being said, not everyone can do that. And that's okay. That is okay. If you have a day job, you're working 40 hours a week, Go is just a game. It's a hobby, right? We all love it. We all play it. But not. we can't just commit 10 to 20 to 30 hours a week to it. Like a certain someone. <laughs> um, we can't all do that, okay? Uh, and that's okay. But a good milestone, if you want to improve at an efficient pace, is try to play 10 games a week if you can. With that being said, when you're learning and trying to improve... And not just playing for fun, but playing to improve. 50% of your time should be playing. 50% should be studying. Studying inv involves reviewing your games, doing Go problems every single day, even if it's just one. If it's just one Go problem. 
Do go problems every single day to keep your eyes trained while you're learning. So review your games, do go problems, watch lectures or videos, uh, or get your game reviews by other people, play teaching games. That's all study. Okay, so 50% play, 50% study. Thank you for the follow. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. And welcome to the stream. So, minimum 10 games a week. I think a good pace for a Westerner... I think a good pace for a Westerner is 20 games a week if you're competitive and trying to improve at a higher level. Right? 20 games a week for a Westerner if you're trying to be competitive. But you can get away with 10 games a week, and that's still a good pace. 10 games a week is a good pace. 10 games a week, go problems every day. Uh, someone mentioned easy problems are better than hard problems. I agree with this. Kind of. This is more how to do go problems, right? Easy problems are much better for... You're exercising your eyes, exercising your readings, and keeping your stone visualization up. That is very good. For preparing for a tournament, what I would do is I play as many games as I can, review like most of them, and do like 100 simple problems a day. That's what I try to do to prepare for a tournament. Um, so, for example, if I have the time and I'm really serious about a tournament... I'll try to play 100 rated games in a month and do 100 simple problems every single day for that month. And then review a lot of the games with an AI to try to understand. Like, I don't have a teacher, unfortunately. Um, so I, I would have to learn how to use the AI. Uh, and I would do, and I would try to figure out some simple ideas that I can try, and I'll try it out for five games. And then figure out how good I'm doing that idea or how bad I'm doing that idea. Review the last couple and say, okay, how did I do with that idea? And then I review it with the AI and keep working on it and fine-tuning and fine-tuning and fine-tuning and do 100 go problems a day. That's what I would do preparing for a tournament if I was super, super serious. But for not everyone can do that. So, um, the type of problems, the way I do go problems or the way I recommend doing go problems is while you're learning you should pick a category of problems. Don't just stick with life and death. Life and death is just one category. But do several categories of problems. Get a book. Books are fantastic. But their OGS also has some great problems. Uh, find different problem libraries. Uh, one on one Chi is one that I highly recommend. Semego Pro is also really good. Um, but get chunks of problems. Like if a lot of people have Semego Pro on the phone. There's like different categories, like 300 problems. Get a chunk, do it three times. Get a book, do it three times. The first time, you don't necessarily need to be able to answer the problems. They might be hard. After 30 seconds to a minute, just look at the answer. Like, read it out and try to solve it. But the first time going through, just look at the answer. That way you learn a new pattern and learn a new shape and learn a new sequence. Okay, on the third time through that set, that chunk, not just 10 problems, but like two or 300 problems, uh, or maybe like 100 problems. I would say 50 to 100 problems is a set. So 50 to 100 to like 300 to 500, I would say that's a set. Do it all three times. If it's like upwards of three to five to 700, maybe do that five times or something. Um, but do it multiple times. On the third time or the latest time, try to solve all of them in your head. When you're preparing for a tournament or something, pick a category that you already know, but you just want to refresh your course. So like sometimes I'll do the pig's mouth, like the big pig and little pig, uh, bit four, just some shapes that I know, but I want a refresher. I'll do those three times. They're going to be easy for me, especially the third time, because it's a sequence that I already know. It's just I, need a, I might need a refresher, and I train my eyes to see it quickly. So I usually can do the problems in like, five to 10 seconds and for the harder ones, maybe 30 to 40 seconds, but I can solve it quickly. And it's just exercising my eyes to recognize these shapes and patterns. That is how I would recommend doing go problems and how you do go problems every time. All right. But that is a little bit off topic. So I'm going to bring it back to Joseki's, uh, but hopefully uh, that gives some advice for that. So again, 
Uh, this one was this sequence. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, that is that one. This one, pretty much the same thing. Except now I'd probably connect here because it's not low. Simple sequence. Okay. Um, now let's talk about if your opponent approaches high. Honestly, with the star point, this is I actually think this is a bad approach to a star point. I usually don't recommend this. 90, probably 99% of the time, this is wrong. Uh, but if your opponent does it, just play normal and make your base. Okay. Same with high. Make your base. Uh, pincers, same thing. You can cut. Uh, I think this is the same thing. Except now you have a tiger's mouth. Same thing. Except now you have a tiger's mouth. Tiger's mouth is much stronger. Um, so they are saying redeem my crap. Unfortunately, this is for a video, so I don't really want to redeem in the right in the middle of it. So. <clears throat> but if you're watching, if you wanted to support, <laughs> description below. I already, I'm already advertising in the description. Um, yeah. So those are the simple, simple Josekis for the star point. Okay, now let's talk about, oh, actually one more about the 3-3. Three, three. Uh, I forgot to mention this one. If you need Sente, here, and then your opponent slides, because remember one point jump that's pre-peeped has cutting points, so they slide, and you take Sente. If they walk, you Hane, they block, you take Sente. This is a little bit more complicated and maybe not very double digit Q friendly. So the stronger you are, the better for this sequence. But if you need Sente, if there's something urgent, this is a way to get Sente. So that's the last little hint about the last little tip about 3 3. Now let's talk about 3 4. Uh, no jumping out of the pincer. Um, this one is not simple. This one is a good one to learn. I do encourage you to learn it, but this is not one of the first Joseki I would learn. I would learn this one later. After you learn the first ones, then I would add this one on later. Okay. So single digit Q or like after you get used to yours, learn this one and learn and single digit Qs, learn this one. Right. Uh, but for the first Josekis that I recommend, I wouldn't start with that one. Start with the three, three. After you get used to those, you can add it on as you see fit. Um, but let, uh, right now I'm just like, what are the, what are the first ones I would learn? <clears throat> All right. This one, let's start with the low. This is very easy. Diagonal. Anyone who's watched the no go knows this move. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty good move. Make a base, um, make a base. That's really simple. You can honestly three space cause two stones can jump three. Um, so if you're like weaker than 15 Q, this one's fine. Uh, 50, like 14 to 13 Q, start learning this one and adding it on and learn how to surround your opponent. Um, single digit Qs, learn this one and this one. This one's also possible. Uh, if you need to be high, um, if there's a low stone, uh, you can also get this move. This one is not good without so other stones, but if you need a combination, this one's good. Uh, locally, if you need a base... This is a quick way to make a base while also taking theirs, and then white just extends for another base. So locally, this is also another sequence. So diagonal, very flexible, very good. Uh, Knight's move is also a good one. I can do that. You extend. Or if there's a third line, you can go high. Uh, if you need a, if you need the corner, same sequence. And the reason I'm showing multiple options is because remember, Josekis are tools. You, one thing I really, really, really want to discourage, don't just play one Joseki, okay? Don't just play one sequence, and don't just force one sequence. Be flexible. Have multiple Joseki options, and pick the one that works for your board, right? Every board is going to be different, right? Uh, slightly different. Pick the Joseki that works for your position. So try to have multiple options. You don't need like a million. Just having two or three options is really good, right? So having like a kick versus having an extension versus having a high extension, that's good enough. 
play flexible to the board. If you need a low option, just mega base, mega base. Very simple. And Tanuki, uh, locally, again, it's the same sequence if you need to. Uh, another A common way to say, if you are if you play here and your opponent doesn't slide for the ice base or jump, you can kick and unsettle. Now they run away and you can chase. So if you have a stone over here and they are not responding, this is a good way to unsettle. Okay, so those are the options like here, here, and here. Those are very simple ones. Uh, pincer, go for the 3-3. Three, 3-3 three. Three, three is really nice for making a base, okay? When in doubt, you can 3-3. Three, three. Uh, attach, Tiger's Mouth, Nobi, Nobi, base. And then white can make life in the corner or run away. Okay. If your opponent Ataris, this one's not simple, unfortunately. But it is doable. It's just Atari and Connect. You just get some influence. Um, and then this is kind of depending on the board. If they play here, you can just make a base. Two stone jumps three. You could also expand an influence if there's an influence. Um, or one space jump if you're not comfortable with two space jumps yet. You can expand the influence. So it's a little bit more flexible. Uh, and definitely nice for making influence. Um, another one is jump, jump, jump. And this depends on the board, but just jump, jump. Uh, if you want, you can learn this one, this one, Tanuki. This one's a, a light shape, so maybe not double digit Q friendly. Uh, but for the when you get closer to single digit Q, or if you are single digit Q, this one's nice if you want to just play fast. And Tanuki, this one's nice. If they try to cut, this is a very bad sequence for black right here. So they have to play something like bamboo. And then they're damaging their own stone, so it's not always good to cut this. So you kind of can't cut without other stones present. Um, so they can, if, the response, if they do too, is just make a base. So those are simple ones. For the single digit cues, learn this one. There's lots of variations with it, but this one's very common in the current meta. Uh, at the time of recording this video, this one's... It's AI Joseki, okay? Um, this is a, this lean with a 3-4 point is very common. So single digit cues, learn this one. Double digit cues, I would avoid this one. It's very complicated because there's cutting points... Uh, there's walking. Um, it's pretty complicated, but you do need to learn it at single digit Q. So I avoid this at double digit Q, but at single digit Q, you do need to learn this. If your opponents do this to you at double digit Q, just make your base. So push and then jump. Push from behind until you can jump and just make your base. That's the simple one for a double digit Q. Okay. Um, high is pretty much the same stuff. Just make your base. Jump, 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 jump. Or jump, two space, jump. Right. Pretty si uh, similar sequences. So the low can get complicated. So I want to I wanna say this, that it can get very complicated. But just start with those. Start with the jumps and make your base. Jumps and make your base. But the pincers with the low can get complicated, but you can learn them one variation at a time. This is back to what I said before. Whatever your opponent plays, let's say they play this one or this one. When your opponents start doing that, then you can start. You can look that up uh, on your own, or you can ask for someone to show you. Then you can learn those one at a time, right? Just learn them as they come up in your games, or as they come up in the opening that you're studying. Okay. But start with the simple ones and then add on as they become relevant. And that's how you learn just like he's one at a time. However, these do get complicated very quickly. If you get confused, just start making a base. Okay. At, at the end of the day, if you get confused, make a base. Uh, 
a lot of these is that simple. It's just both players trying to make a base. Now, if they go high, <clears throat> let's start with the, uh, I know everyone's going to look at this one. So let's start with this one first. Here, fix the cut, uh, make a base. <clears throat> Two stones, a diagonal, can jump three. So at single digit Q, learn this one. Uh, but just, if you want to keep it simple at double digit Q, this is fine. Uh, black is already alive because there's a Panuki right here and right here. Uh, you can make an eye in the corner. So black is already alive, so black can ignore. So this is good for developing. Okay. If you're playing something like the Chinese opening. Now I'll show you a Chinese opening just like they use that. The Chinese opening, you already have a pincer. So this one's very nice in the Chinese opening. Because instead of this tiger's mouth, you can actually uh, walk under to, to try to look at the eye space. Okay, this one's nice. So this one you do if you're wanting to poke the eye space. But this one is the safe one. So the Josegi for the Chinese opening, this is not important for double digit cues to remember, but if you want to learn the Chinese opening, this is the Joseki. Expand your eye space. This move is optional. You can Tanuki, but this is the way to seal because elephant's eye. White is alive. <clears throat> okay. This is the Chinese opening, Joseki. The idea is black wants to surround, white wants eye space. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because it's not as important. But that's the Joseki, and that's a that's the time that you can use this one is when they're already pincer and you want to poke the eye space. So that one's a high one. So when now we need a low one. This one we can slide if we want to poke the eye space, or we can play a tiger's mouth. Both are fine. And then white makes a base. Uh, a good rule of thumb is if your opponent plays this, go ahead and do the three space. Because the two space isn't worth it anymore if your opponent's already poking your base. So now it's better to be flexible. It's a little more difficult to use, but again, two stones can jump three. We need to learn these variations. Okay, it's a little more difficult, so it's not, again, it's not one of those double digit Q friendly ones, but you can learn it just one thing at a time, one variation at a time. But the the kind of rule of thumb is if your opponent plays uh, the second line move to poke your base, you do need to jump three uh, and get game reviews, ask people for help, learn the variations one at a time. Okay. Uh, pincers. These are, again, three, the three, four has the more complicated ones, but let's keep it simple. Diagonal, base, um, and then shoulder head. The simple idea is black just makes the base, right? You push until you can't be cut, and then you jump. White gets influence. That's the simple idea. Okay, um, for the single digit cues, you should learn this one. The reason is it's very, very easy to sacrifice um, in here and gain forcing moves. So let's see if I remember this. If he does this, you can just walk out because uh, these are bad variations for white. Uh, or you can walk out here and then go here. These are bad variations for white, okay? So usually white cuts on the outside. Um, and then tries to do that. And then you have a lot of forcing moves. You have a, uh, you have a nose to Suji. Lots of little forcing moves here. And it's also really cramped for white. So it's not really ideal for white to play this one. White's response is actually here. And I encourage you to look up the Joseki's involved in this. At single digit Q. It's very interesting. 
Uh, it's actually not too difficult. It's just squeeze plays and stuff, but not double digit cube friendly. <laughs> uh, so that's a simple one is just diagonal, make a base, and lean to get influence. Uh, I don't know if I want to encourage this one, but this is one you will need to learn later on how this peep works. So if you don't remember this one, don't worry about it. Just know that it exists and that you should learn it eventually. Because of that sequence and this stone being an empty triangle, this one came about. Um, and it is pretty complicated. So single digit cues. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure that's a move. Uh, single digit cues can look more into that. Um, if they do this attachment, just make a base. Oh, sorry. Actually, it's I, I'm wrong. This one's not correct. This one's not correct. It was this one versus this one. That's what it was. Sorry. Uh, I miss, made a mistake in my brain. Uh, if they do this, just fix a double digit Q. Single digit Q, you can learn more about this. And you see how it's in a better spot. Not important for double digit cues though. Just make your base. Again, just make your base. Fix this. If you make your base here, it's not the end of the world. Because you can actually just connect under. Um, you can also just sacrifice and just make a base. But the idea is just make a base. Uh, but just fix. Um, high, the simple for high, jump, 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 pincer. This leads to a fighting game, but it's probably the simplest variation. <laughs> uh, the other idea is two space, two, pay, two space, pincer. If I were you, I would only two space when you have support until like 12 Q plus, maybe 10 Q plus actually. So only when there's support, two space high to develop and then just make a base on this side and it's easy, right? And you can deal with any fight because you have support. But playing this one without support, um, I think it's just easier to play one space low. On an empty side, just play one space low. But with support, you do need this option. You always want to have multiple options. Uh, just make a base on this side, or you can just match your opponent. And that's simple for black. For white, just jump, 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 jump. Just run away with a weaker. Uh, single digit cues. You got to learn this one. Sorry. And also... You need to learn this response. This one's a trick move, but it's very painful if you mess it up, so you kind of need to know it. Uh, there's also this one. <laughs> this one, don't worry about, okay? Don't worry about this one. However, if you're single digit Q and you want, you know, something fun to learn and fun to try, this one's quote unquote fun but I don't encourage this as one of your basic variations. <laughs> it's very complicated. So for double digit cues, just jump. If you start forgetting stuff, a simple idea is to just make a base. This is bad for you, but you won't die. So if you forget, Make a base. Um, I know there are variations here. I just forget them. So single digit cues, you guys can look at that. Uh, so those are simple ones. 
Now, this Joseki. This is one of my least favorite Josekis, okay? Because it is stupidly powerful. This Joseki works in eight like 80% of the situations, if not more. So if you forget your Josekis, you can do this one. But the reason I don't like it is because Q players become dependent on this Joseki and don't have other options. And I really, really, really don't like it when you only give yourself one Joseki option. I always want you to have multiple options and multiple tools to work with. With that being said, this is a very good Joseki that is used quite often. I just don't want this to be your only Joseki. I don't want you to become dependent on this. Okay, so um, let me answer this question first and then I'll go through the variations. So what sort of thought process should go into picking your different Josekis? So if you, uh, I know you weren't here for the beginning of the video, but the beginning of the video, I talked about having what's more important is the direction of play. So you say, do I want the A side or do I want the B side? And then you pick a Joseki that works with the direction of play. And the idea is having multiple Josekis in your toolbox to use depending on what you need. Usually I recommend one low, one high, one low, one high for both directions. And I say, start with that. Start with that. And then add on as you experience higher level Josekis. Okay. So the Joseki is Hane, come back, fix the cut, extend, make a base. That's the Joseki. Now, the other option, white can play a tiger's mouth. Because you can go one stone further, because two stone jumps three, you get one line further. This is good if, say, there's a Shamari over here. So, for example, uh, let's say I play this one. Now there's a Shamari, so I want to reduce the extension of the Shamari as much as possible. If I connect, you can see my opponent gets one line further. So sometimes when there's extra stuff, you'll go to the Tiger's Mouth. But one, otherwise, just connect. Okay. Now, with the Tiger's Mouth, you actually want to jump two. And then why place here? The reason is is because at higher levels, white can peep right here, and black connects because of the cutting points, and now white can tanuki. This is a very flexible shape at the higher levels. So the single digit cues should remember this more than double digit cues, but the idea is if I connect, one space jump. If I tiger's mouth, two space jump. Okay, because if I two space jump against here, I can very easily get pushed down. Okay, so I lose the two points. However, if my opponent is going to try to be flexible and fast, then he's going to have to give me two points to do it. Okay, so now if he wants to be flexible, I get two extra points. So if my opponent wants to be flexible, they're going to have to pay me two points. But if they're just going to be simple, okay, I'll just play here. There's a lot of Yose and peeps and stuff that are involved in here, so don't worry about it too much until you're higher level. But the idea or the rule of thumb is they connect one space. They target's mouth two space. When in doubt, just one space. Like for a double digit Q, one space is fine in both cases, okay? For a double digit Q, this is fine. It's just, it gives your opponent the option to play more flexible, but a double digit Q, this is not that important because your opponents usually don't know this. But a single digit Q, you will need to learn this. Uh, so that's the rule of thumb. But when in doubt, just play one space to be safe because technically two space has a lot more Aji in here. So it's a little bit more difficult. So it's not worth it unless your opponent plays a Tiger's Mouth. Um, but that's the idea. And like I said, this Joseki 
is good almost always. It's not always good, but most of the time it is good. And that is why I really discourage you from overly relying on this Joseki. Now, with that being said, you do need to know this Joseki. It is a very good Joseki, but don't only play this Joseki. It will hold you back from learning other stuff. Uh, someone asked, can white play here? Yes. Yes, white can. Uh, I wouldn't do it at double digit Q unless you, uh, there was a white stone over here. Because let's say if there's a white stone, then yeah, you have support on both sides, play fourth line. But at single digit Q, you can put more emphasis on the center, even if you get undercut a little bit, because the center might be very important. So yes, this is an option, but I encourage double digit Qs to make their bases on the third line and learn how to play fourth line later. Uh, what do I mean when I say it's a very good Joseki? Josekis are even trades. Yes. The reason I say it's a good Joseki is because it's kind of a Swiss army knife. It's useful in a lot of opening patterns. In other words, more times than not, this Joseki will work. So as a Joseki, it works a lot of the time. So it's not that it's better for one or the other. It's that it's, uh, it's a good Joseki option in a majority of board positions. The reason I don't like that is because I don't want people who are trying to learn and improve to be overly dependent on it because it's so flexible. So, the, this Joseki works in a lot of positions. I just don't want players to be overly dependent on it. So I want you to be able to use it. It's a very good Joseki. One, one of the simplest ones to use. But don't be overly dependent on it. For example, and say, I'm afraid of pincering. I'm never going to pincer. I'm only going to play this one. I really don't like that mindset. You're supposed to be a student. You're supposed to learn. Supposed to get new Josekis in your mental dictionary. Yeah, so it's a good Joseki to learn. I just don't want this to be your only option. Okay, I want to stress this. This is a good Joseki. This is a very good Joseki. Very important for you to learn. A very good starting Joseki. But don't only learn this one. Learn more than one. And every time something different comes up, Add to your Joseki dictionary in your mental brain. Okay. Don players should know thousand, at least a thousand Josekis. So if you want to get to Don, learn Josekis one at a time, and you should know at least a thousand Josekis. Learning a thousand Josekis is taking learning one at a time. Yeah, I think JGR kind of got the hit the nail on the head. Basic Joseki collection is 10 or so, I guess. 4, 4, 3, 4, times 2 sides, times high versus low, plus 2 for the 3, 3. Yeah. Now, with that being said, we haven't talked about the 3, 3. 3, 3 is a common move. This one is the simplest, though. One space away. Go up, base, base. Okay. Pincer, jump, base, uh, jump, or slide, or whatever. Pincer, jump, jump. These are the simple ones. High, same thing. Jump or uh, jump to make a base, jump to make a base. 3-3 three, three is one of the simplest Josekis. You just make your base. Right? Uh, the confusing one might be here. This one's not super important to remember. And I also think this one, uh, the AI ruled, was good for white, I believe, if you played this way. This is the this is the old pattern. The influence is supposed to be a little bit good for white, I believe. So now it's more make your base. Or pincer and turn it into a 3-3 three, three variation. It's gonna be here, cut. Hey, this looks familiar.
So 3-3 three, three is actually one of the easier ones. However, 3-3 three, three doesn't have a lot of influence. So it's very easy to make influence against the 3-3. Three, three. But there are players that like 3-3, three, three, and I don't want to discourage 3-3. Three, 3-3 three. Three, three is a valid opening move. Uh, it's just not very meta. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like JGR said, King's Gambit, uh, it's not 1,000 exclusive things, but rather 1,000 variations. So, for example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Nine, ten, oh yeah, eleven, I guess you could argue twelve, um, uh, thirteen, yeah, just, you add them all up. I probably talked about 50 Josekis today. Yeah, so the thing about Go, so here's a, so I know you're worried about memorizing openings, Kings. Let me, uh, let me elaborate on this. The Josekis are kind of just like variations. They're not openings, okay? You don't have to memorize openings in Go. There are good openings to learn, but the thing is, is um go is very flexible so even with our common openings like with go we do have common openings and we do have branches kind of like in chess where you have different answers for different responses and stuff but the openings change probably every five years <laughs> like every five years the meta of the opening changes so the cool thing about openings is you can learn openings similar to chess and you can learn josekis for that opening but even learning those, there's usually other variations as well. Go is very, very flexible. There's so many options, okay? So even though there are opening patterns, it's less about memorizing every opening pattern and more about just learning your favorites, okay? Learning the ones that lead to the results that you want. And that's why Go is so flexible. Don't think of Josekis as something you have to do, but rather different options for different things that you want the direction to go. Josekis are just different choices. They're not really strict set in stones. And these are the Josekis that I recommend. I haven't even gotten to the Tanukis. Like, what if I Tanuki? There's Josekis for Tanuki, right? What if I to, uh, want to pincer or Tanuki again, right? Go is... Don't think of Go as like you have to play those Josekis. I really want to stress, don't limit yourself to just a few Josekis. Always add to it. Always add more options to yourself. Go is very free like that. But because Go is so free and there's so many options, we want to start somewhere. We want to start with some simpler variations and then add on more complex ones as we go. And we just have all these options to pick from. But let's just, to not get overwhelmed, give ourselves a few starting options. And that's what the Josekis we're looking at are about. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not understanding that question. I don't want to go too much into that. Uh, I don't want to go backtracking to figure out that variation. Uh, so hopefully I didn't scare you away from the opening stuff by uh, saying you have to memorize stuff. No. It's not really the idea. It's more about learning these patterns as a starting point and then adding on more patterns as you go and then saying which patterns work for which board. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Go is pretty free. And especially with AI, we've learned more and more 
and more options, right? We've learned different styles. Um, so rather than thinking of a Joseki as things you have to memorize, like opening patterns you have to memorize, think of it as how do you want the game to go? And then what patterns could you come up with to get there? Josekis are the patterns that pros came up with to show us. But actually, there's probably Josekis that even pros don't know that they just haven't discovered yet. And the reason we cho choose Josekis is because our creativity is not as good as a professional's. And so Josekis are kind of our shortcut creativity. So unfortunately, while Go is very free, professionals are a little bit better at creativeness than we are, so we kind of have to uh, learn from them and use the common variations that they come up with and understand the whys and ins and outs of those. So hopefully I didn't kill the opening for you. Hopefully I didn't discourage that. Uh, hopefully you still feel the freedom of Go. because there's a, Trust me, the more you get into Go, the more you explore the deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper it is, and the more vast it is. So I hope I'm not scaring you away from that by trying to simplify it. Um, but I'm trying to give you, like, simple things to kind of create shortcuts, I guess. So, yeah. <clears throat> so hopefully, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah, so that pretty much concludes all my basic variations. Uh, so hopefully you guys did find that useful. And in the future, if you need it, just look at look for this in the VODs. <clears throat> yeah. So Go can be overwhelming with the amount of options you have. So we utilize theories and shapes and patterns to simplify our options. But there's a lot of freaking options. <laughs> uh, this will go on YouTube. It will go on YouTube, uh, but I have to edit it and or I have to cut it all and put it on YouTube. So this will be on YouTube in the future. But if you need it, like in the next week or so, just check the mods. Uh, so this will be going on both. Um, but I, hopefully you guys did find this lecture helpful, and hopefully this will make Joseki's more interesting for you and give you more options. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully this will give you more options. Uh, and I will go ahead and link this for you guys in the chat. And for the YouTube video, I don't know if I'll cut this part or not, but it's OGS slash demo slash view slash 571852. Demo view 571852. So yeah, hopefully you guys did find this useful. And as always, guys, I do appreciate everyone for watching. And since this is the end, let me just plug in my uh, stuff real quick, and then we will find someone to raid. Um, I can name the demo boards. <laughs> uh, I don't know how. <laughs> Oops. Uh, yeah, I stream four days a week. And unless something comes up in real life, I try to stream four days a week. So I do this kind of full time. Uh, I, I'm actually, I think I'm at like full time technically, almost full time. <laughs> but pretty much, this is my main job. This is what I do. This is my this is my job. I do this like full time. So four days a week, I teach Go. Uh, so my plugs are: if you are if you liked what you see and you would like your own games reviewed, consider hitting that sub button down below. Uh, one day a week is open reviews for anyone to join, but the other three days are sub onlys. They are first come first serve. So if you would like to be eligible, uh, click that sub button below. It also supports me reviewing games for four days a week. Um, so that option is there. And if you are interested in getting guaranteed game reviews, check out the Patreon. Uh, I do have an option for guaranteed game reviews. You get one, one review a week guaranteed. Uh, it's not live, but you send it to me and I make it into a video or a review it on stream or something. Uh, but I do re that is a guaranteed review. Uh, you can also get lessons through Patreon. 
and, pay, and supporting on Patreon supports the creation of new series and lectures like this one that you just saw. So Patreon is another great way to support me um, doing this full time. So if you like what I do, uh, do consider supporting. I'm able to do uh, what I do and teach everyone and teach the community. Thanks to the support of all of the subscribers on Twitch and the supporters on Patreon. Uh, but don't feel discouraged about asking for help or asking questions or getting your games reviewed. If you are not able to support financially, that is okay. Just supporting by watching is also possible. And I do have the Klossy points down below. You can still get your game reviews with Klossy points just by watching. I do consider that support. Uh, the Klossy points uh, game reviews will skip the queue even on a sub day and you will be able to get a game review. You can also save up and get a lesson as well using Klossy points. So just watching the stream is a great way to support as well. So thanks to everyone who does support and make what I do possible. Um, again, if you're interested in the AI Joseki, I have three copies left and I will probably not be able to restock until January or February. Uh, it looks like one uh, someone on Discord has already sent me a message. So I might only have two copies left. Um, and let, So this will be first come first serve. And I'll try to look at the timestamps on the Discord. So I might sell all of them today. I might not, but just last call for these books. Um, and yeah, so thanks to everyone for supporting. Thanks for everyone for watching. And hopefully you guys enjoy this. This is 100 AI Josekis written by, written by a Korean professional. There is English descriptions. It's it's uh, translated. So there's Korean and English descriptions. Uh, they're 100 AI Josekis. Uh, I bought them in bulk and I'm selling them in the United States. Canada and Mexico. It's $45 for shipping in the U S it is $50 to Canada and Mexico. Uh, but if you are in North America, there might be someone selling it in, uh, sorry, not North America. If you are in Europe, they also might sell them somewhere in Europe. But uh, as far as I know, I'm the only one selling them in the U S and North America. As soon as a bookstore picks it up or something, or a book publisher picks it up, then I'll stop selling them. I'll just get my own. But since I really like these books and I didn't see anyone else selling them, I wanted to go ahead and, you know, hashtag side hustle and also give you guys the option to get these if you don't know how to get them yourselves. <clears throat> uh, sending to Brazil. If you really want me to, I can check, but the shipping and handling is going to probably be more than the book is worth to send it out of continent. Uh, if you really want me to send it to you, I don't think it's worth it. But if you pay the shipping and handling, I mean, I will. Uh, I just want to let you know that it's going to be expensive and might be more than the book is worth. <clears throat> um, but yeah, uh, I would look into ordering it from Korea directly or ordering it from somewhere in your country, but... Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, if you are interested in that, I do have it, but if you are outside of North America, I encourage you to look, uh, to Kim Sung Ray or something first on Facebook or something and see if you can get it for cheaper buying it directly, because I do believe that mine would be a slight ripoff and I don't want to take advantage of anyone with that because the shipping and handling, you're paying for shipping and handling twice, the shipping from Korea to North America and then to another continent instead of just from Asia to your continent. So I don't want to overcharge you or take advantage of you or anything like that. But if you do want it from me, um, I will do it. It's just, just know that that is a thing. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and find someone to raid. Uh, this is going to be 